So, how are you? How's business? Do you know what? Business is actually good. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah it is. It's really good. T- turnover's down slightly, but we, we, you know, our profitability is slightly up on on last year. So, business has actually been been, been good. We've we've held our our own um, in the last twelve months. So, very pleased. We had a budget yesterday, and I don't know about you, but there wasn't there wasn't as much change as I thought there might be. Well, I think, I mean, before the budget, I was expecting, like, real doom and gloom. You, you know, I was thinking, okay, after borrowing 300 billion and another 100 billion to, to, to the rest of the furlough, you know, how much tax are we going to be paying back and for how long? So I was actually pleasantly surprised. It wasn't, uh, I actually thought it was quite a good budget. So, you know, it, I, I thought it was really bold. Um Rishi looks like he's trying to spend his way out of it, um, which also makes sense to, for, for me. You know, if, he, if he's borrowing all this money while interest rates are so low, um, to to be able to to do what he's actually done, I, I, I think it's brilliant. Anything well. that he said that you were particularly pleased about? Yeah, there the, the, the probably was not not necessarily uh, pleased in terms of it would affect you know my business, but. I think there's still a, there's a lot of support uh, out there, like extending the furlough scheme and the sea bills, and um, you know certain sectors like your hospitality, um, you know, reducing the, the or keeping the VAT at the same rate. I think I think that is going to help our customers survive because that was that that's one of my big concerns is the fact that when when all this aid and you know money floating around the marketplace. Um, when that finishes, will our customers still, you know, will they run out of cash? Will they start going, uh, you know, bust on us? Or, you know, the, the knock-on effect is, is Did you see anything yesterday that you thought that's great news? Um, no, I think it was a no shocks um, uh, kind of announcement. Nothing really surprised me. Um, the, the one that frightened me was the corporation tax. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I'm sure as a, as a business owner of a medium to large business, you know, you, you, you're going to have, you know, people feeling a bit sore about that. Um, what did you think about the two years? The fact that there's a bit of a cliff edge, isn't there? So, um, you know, he's not implementing it for a couple of years. And then one from one day, you go from 19% to 25%. So for me, I would have quite liked to incremental, you know, yeah. just to sort of get used to it. Um, so that was a bit of a shock to me. What did you what did you think? Yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, doing a, a couple of percent each year would be a, a lot better than what is it is six percent, isn't it, in 2023? Yeah. So yeah, I'd have done I'd have done a couple of percent each year, I think, if it, if it was me. But then you know, maybe it'll just give uh, give businesses a couple of years to plan for uh, for a couple of really really bad years in twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. You know that that's that's the other thing that um, you know a lot of people you know talk about, isn't it? You know, there's lots and lots of big corporations that avoid paying corporation tax, and and similarly, there's lots of very very small self employed people that that um, have spent years avoiding tax. Um, by not declaring all of their turnover, etc., and you know those guys are suffering now, aren't they? Because they're not they're not Absolutely. getting the uh, they've not got the they've not got the books and the records to to qualify for all the grants. Um, but yeah, the big the big corporations, you know that, that that's where you know I'd like to see the, the government, you know, making sure that people pay pay a fair amount of tax. Working rules that are coming in in April, which we've all known about for a long time, and obviously they were due to come in last April, and then didn't they got sort of pushed back because of covid um how is that going to affect the construction industry is that going to have um a, a, you know a radical sh- is it going to be a radical shift or is it just that people have got used to that now and they're, they're working around it no I, th- I think it will be a radical shift i mean we're, we're not massively affected by it because we we employ our you know our workforce and then we um, you know we're a management contractor so we we employ managers and professionals and then we subcontract to other businesses, um, you know, labour, plant, and materials. So they're they're responsible for how they employ their tradesmen. Um, so, but, but we are aware that you know, if, I mean, I've got a scheme in Manchester at the minute with about fifty dry liners on on on, on the projects. 
Um, I would imagine that other than the supervisor or the couple of supervisors that might be cards in employees, um, 98% of the rest of them will all be labor only subcontractors. Um, but I think that what that does is it kind of generates a bit of a, a negative culture in construction. You know, we've got a, I can, I can talk about this for ages, but we've got a big, uh, a big skills gap in construction and we've got a big, a big shift from when I started in the industry and people, you, you, you had real tradesmen that really, really cared about what they did and, and, and took time and uh, were really proud of what they, they achieved. And what we've got now is a big shift. The majority of the tradesmen that, that we come across um, are all about paying as little tax as they can, earning as much, as much money in as little time as they possibly can. And there's not really a lot of loyalty because they jump from employer to employer. Um, so that selfish kind of approach to um, how they take home as much money as possible on, on each individual week and there's very, very little loyalty has actually damaged the industry quite a lot. A, a lot. You know, um, getting people to stay on site after three o'clock in the afternoon now is just really, really difficult. I, I often tell stories about when I was a, a young surveyor and I was doing the wages for construction guys on site, we had guys earning 800, 900 pounds a week, which in, in the late nineties was a lot of money. Um, and, and they were on price work. So they were working longer hours and doing more, more things. Um, and we rewarded them accordingly. What happens now is if you set, in my experience, and I won't say this is all, you know, in every case, but in, in the vast majority of cases, if we give somebody a, piece of price work to do where they can earn a thousand pounds a week or 1500 pounds a week if they work really really hard what they'll do is they'll get to 750 quid and they'll take the tools and they'll go home at 10 o'clock on a friday morning which is not good for um productivity you know the reason we bonus people on site and want them to do more and want, want to work longer is because we're we're chasing deadlines or we you know we've got some pressures elsewhere in the program uh, so that that I think the new tax rules um, or new employment rules, I suppose, um, should help that culture. I think it will get more people buying in uh, and becoming more loyal uh, to their employer rather than being a really, really selfish uh, kind of, you know, it's all about me and how much money I earn. Do you get IR35 rules? I think they're a massive um, shift. You know, people used to do their apprenticeships um, you know, people, you know, a local firm that does this really, really well is, is Seddon's. Um, you know, they're, they're a Bolton-based firm, employed 500 and odd people, turn over hundreds of millions of pounds, but their, their apprentice, apprentice scheme is brilliant. Um, and, and there are other kind of great uh, examples of people who do apprenticeships really, really well. But what tends to happen is they get to the end of their apprenticeship and then they immediately... You know, they've, they've spoken to other people in the industry and they immediately want to go and be, become self-employed and earn the big bucks. And that's where that culture shift happens quite quickly. So I think, yeah, the government needs to push that. I think, you know, if the government were pushing it and there were grants, of it, better grants available uh, and, and there wasn't the outlet for people to just abandon you after you've put a load of hard work in to get the, the apprenticeships done, um, you know, that, that, I don't think that opportunity will be there in the future because... People will have to be employees rather than subcontractors. What what was it that you were either expecting him to do? What what is it that you wish that he'd done um, in his speech yesterday that he didn't? Well, I, I'll start with. I'm glad that he didn't do any of these online sales tax sort of things. The reason for that is, I mean, and I say this, okay. So within my business, there's this sort of four separate income drivers. I mean, we do. We do a lot of business online. We obviously sort of do, our, we have the various websites, we have Amazon, eBay, and we also, but also do a lot of um, distribution to physical retail. So one of our big customers is, is Asda. We also do a deal with B&M and stuff. And we sell in our wholesale business to lots of different physical retailers. But I think there's this misconception by a lot of people who sort of like look at the economy as online and offline, that online is so much cheaper to do business in than, um, than offline and that, and it's because they, because of that they can drive low prices and all that sort of stuff and they have a massive advantage because of rates or whatever stuff like if you if you're a physical store you don't really price compete to to the same degree that online does my store competes with all our, our stores compete with all the different online competitors and you're a click away the average website customer will spend like three seconds on your website 
no one is walking into Debenhams or John Lewis for three seconds looking at it and then walking 100 yards down the street. So for us, I mean, we're looking at putting in additional robotization. So we'd like to do ro like more robotic pick and pack and stuff for increased accuracy and faster turnaround times. Um, so I, I'd have liked to see potentially more grants towards aimed at SMEs primarily because to help them do that sort of stuff. Because what I see is, what I see is this, and every single person who's got an SME, every independent business will hear this and they'll agree with me. When you look at where government invests, it's typically oftentimes into these really large businesses who are just expatriating profits back into their home territory. So say for example, you know, Amazon's the one that's always sort of singled out, but there's loads of examples. Um, you know, I'm sure IKEA gets money to go on brownfield sites and stuff. You get these like businesses who just bob a warehouse into a particular location. And because they say, we're gonna create jobs, the government chucks loads of money at them. And in reality, they then declare zero profit because they might charge an image fee or licensing fee or whatever back into the home territory or Bermuda or wherever it is. When I worked for Accenture, they were based in Bermuda and it allowed them to do some cool tax things, I guess. Um, and so the government gives them this money. They might recoup some of the money through income taxes for the people employed in the area. But typically you're not creating amazing, like dynamic jobs and stuff. You, you, you sort of like, you, you, it's just sort of basic stuff to fulfill a market and the money is expected out. out. And those companies can do all this cool stuff that makes them super competitive because they've got massive share funding or private equity or venture capital or whatever. Whereas a lot of these SMEs, they can't do it. Like if we wanted to put robots into our warehouse and stuff and do an Ocado type robot thing, that's about a million pounds. And for an SME, that's a large amount of money. But for people like, you know, the Hut Group or Amazon or whatever, they're happy to run at a cash flow negative state. As long as the EBITDA is profitable and can be made to look profitable, you're happy to run cash flow negative. And so you end up having the government feeding businesses that don't really need the money and not really building any homegrown talent to the to, to most degree. So I would have liked to see potentially more focus on SMEs because SMEs are you like children and these are the children that are going to become taxpayers when they're older. And if you want to have a business that's going to compete on a global scale with people like, you know, with the behemoths like Google, Alibaba, Facebook, et cetera, all these mega companies, they all come out of the States where there's this massive ability to generate capital. And the, state, the UK doesn't have that same ability. So if the government wants to create leaders they need to invest in smes they need to, they need to be the capital themselves to invest in these smes and make them into to enable them to become worldwide competitive businesses i suppose that comes back to that innovation point again doesn't it you know yeah. that, you know you need to be thinking about this in a more sophisticated way rather than what it feels sometimes is that tax system in the uk is very clunky and it's a uh, right we're doing this and it doesn't quite fit anybody but we're just going to put it in anyway it needs to be more refined because business is a lot more complicated and sophisticated than it's ever been and laws you know that have evolved over a, a period of time don't take account of the fact that progress is very swift now and that it's not again it's not agile enough to keep up with the changing face of business so I think you're right, it would be nice if it were a bit more bespoke. So there was a lot of speculation ahead of today's budget, as there always is, uh, about changes specifically to tax. Were you surprised at what was and wasn't included in the budget today? I think there was a little bit of speculation over the weekend about the changes to corporation tax, so obviously that wasn't, wasn't a surprise to anyone. I think the key big surprise was what wasn't said, I think. There's been a lot of speculation over the last 12 months about uh, where he's going to go with, co with capital gains tax. Um, obviously, with the business asset disposal relief changing in March of last year, and then the instruction to the um, Office of Tax Simplification in July to take a look at the, the CGT. Um, it's what he didn't say. We were obviously expecting um, quite a bit of um, adjustment to that this time around, which didn't happen. So that was the biggest surprise, I think, from our, from our point of view. I mean, you've mentioned, obviously, the corporation tax rises. Those don't come into play until 2023. That is unusual for a chancellor to announce a tax change, which is two years away. Mm -hmm. How do you think your clients will view that change? I think, I think the initial reaction will be that he, he's... He's looking to see how quickly and how strongly the, the economy recovers. I mean, there's a lot of good news in today's budget. Um, there's a lot of quick, 
quick wins, if you like, the extension to the furlough, the business rate holiday extension, some, some of the, the restart grants, etc. cetera. Um, and I think he's sort of warning us of what the bad news is to come, but obviously trying to see um, what damage has been done and how quickly it restarts. So I, I think it'll be seen positively in it, it. It does give an opportunity for businesses to actually get a bit of, a, bit of a, a kick start before before things start to hit home again. We all know that we've got a, a large deficit to, to um, deal with and we all know it's coming. It's just obviously the, the, the further away that is in terms of allowing businesses to recover, I think we'll be seen positively. So if there was one measure that he notes today that you feel is the most important for our clients, which one would you choose? I think that's a tough one. I think the extension to the furlough, particularly in some some areas, um, will be seen as a, as a key one, particularly obviously in, in the hospitality sector, which is going to see itself getting back to some kind of, of normal uh, in the summer, but obviously won't get back to full normal till, till later in the year. I think the furlough will be seen as positive. And I think, I think it's just that not hitting us too quickly will be seen positively rather than actually what, what he did do, it's what he didn't do. I think he, he, there was a lot of speculation that it could be quite a, a heavy, uh, heavy budget, but actually it was quite a friendly budget.